Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. I know we all have a lot of stuff going on this summer. I have a daughter who's about to go into eighth grade, so she's studying for the SHSAT and everything else as well. So I know how busy you all are this summer. I am going to talk about three things tonight. I'm going to start by talking about myself and about how I became an author. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the publishing business and how it works. And then I'm going to talk about how if you're interested in being part of the publishing business, if you're interested in being an author, how you can do that. There used to be very few ways, but now there are actually a lot of options. And they're open to people of all ages. So that's something that we'll cover. If you look over to, I guess it's the right side, you'll see there's a chat window there. If you have any questions, please type them in. I will answer them. And again, thank you for coming. I know you had a lot of things to do tonight. So I'm going to start with a very simple fact. Um, I wasn't born in the United States. I was actually born in the former Soviet Union. Now it's Ukraine. At the time that I was born there, it was Odessa in the USSR. I came to the United States when I was seven years old. I didn't speak any English. I was put right into an English speaking classroom, no dual language, no English as a second language, just drop right in there. So one of the first things that I actually want to stress is you do not have to be a native English speaker in order to be a writer. You, of course, need to have a good grasp of the English language, but I sometimes have people say to me, well, I don't think I could ever be a writer because I only learned English, you know, when I was in second grade or when I was in fourth grade or when I was in 10th grade. And the fact of the matter is publishing really looks for authentic voices. And authentic voices doesn't mean you speak perfect English. There are people who edit you. There are people called copy editors who will go through, and even if you're a native English speaker, believe me, I have lots of friends who are native English speakers who are authors, and a copy editor still goes through and finds their grammar mistakes. So the first thing I want to make clear is you do not have to be a native English speaker. So after I came to the United States at age seven, and I did learn English. I then went to, I, would, I lived out in San Francisco, and I went to what I guess would be considered a specialized high school there. Um, and, but then after that, I went to a state university. The state university was about 10 blocks from my house. Um, I lived at home. I saved money. I know a lot, as I'm sure a lot of you know, if you're from an immigrant family, this concept of going away to college is actually kind of strange. You're just expected to live at home. So I did do that. And one of the other things that I want to stress is, because this is something people ask, is do you have to major in English in college in order to be a writer? Do you have to major in creative writing in college in order to be a writer? And the answer is absolutely positively not. Unlike some other careers, if you want to be a doctor, if you want to be a lawyer, if you want to be an engineer, where people want to know what you majored in in college, Writing, it does not matter. Nobody has ever asked me what I majored in in college when it came to submitting my manuscripts. And in fact, I didn't major in English. I didn't major in creative writing. I actually majored in writing for television because that was the other thing. How did I learn English? Sure, I went to school and school's good for that, but I really learned English by watching TV. I read a lot. I'm not pretending I didn't read a lot. I was that kid who at my library, the maximum number of books you could take out was eight per week. And there I was every, every week getting my eight books. So I read a lot, but I also watched a ton of TV. And that's another thing I tell people, read, definitely read. But you know, storytelling is storytelling and story structure is story structure. And you can learn a lot of it from TV. And um, I don't know, maybe not so much TikTok. I don't think there's a lot of story structure in TikTok. But some of the ones I've seen is actually does have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So don't think that you have to just sit and be buried in a book. You can do all sorts of other things as well. So I study television in college. But now when people ask me what they should study, if they want to be writers, I actually tell them study things that will make you understand people because writing really is about people. So study psychology, study anthropology, study sociology, study biology, study neuroscience. Those are all things that are going to make you understand people, how people act, why people act the way they act, how people think. All of these are extremely 
important for people who want to be writers. And this is something, this is my own personal pitch. I read so much scientific writing that's like journalists covering a study or a scientific discovery. And so few journalists and writers, nonfiction writers, fiction writers, don't really understand science, don't understand statistics, don't understand math, don't understand how to analyze things. So if I can make a pitch for people who are thinking maybe they want to be writers, but they're not sure if they want to write fiction, the world desperately needs good nonfiction writers who can take science and make it palatable, make it understandable for people who don't understand science. So I think if you love writing, but you also love math and you love science or you love statistics or you love computer programming or you love engineering, there is a great need for people who can take very difficult technical information and who can turn it into something readable for non-technical people. So that's definitely something I want people to consider. Um, also consider studying history. History will certainly teach you about people at least what they do, if not why they do it. And the other thing is um, live life. Because if you want to write, you have to have something worth writing about. And it's very difficult to write without having experienced things. So have fun, do slightly dangerous things. I mean, I, I now have this fear that there are parents sitting behind their children saying, no, no, don't listen to her, she's crazy. Don't do terribly dangerous things. But take some chances, because taking chances is experiencing emotion. And writing really is all about emotion. Whether you're telling a fictional story or you're telling nonfiction. The fact is for nonfiction, you still have to make people feel why they should care. And it's very difficult to write about feelings if you haven't experienced them. So here's my, my college piece. You don't have to study writing, study whatever you're interested in, study whatever aspect of human beings or history or science that you're interested in, but also don't forget to live life a little bit too. It's very important that if you're gonna write, that you have something interesting to write about. So that's about what you can do in college. So I graduated college. And I was working in TV. I was actually working for a television show that I'll tell you about in a little bit. But um, I started trying to sell books. And this would have been in the early 1990s. So this is before the internet. I know it's hard to believe, but there was a time before you could just type a couple of words on your computer and hit a button and the person would get it within minutes. What we used to have to do, first of all, um, we would type on a computer. But if we wanted to send that information from our computer, we had two choices. One is we could put it on a disk. It's about this big. It's called a floppy disk. The information was put on the disk and we actually had to mail it to someone through the United States Postal Service or walk and hand it to them. We could do that too. Or we could print things out, but it wasn't the laser printers that you're used to. It was a dot matrix printer like eh, eh, it typed each line almost in real time. So if I had to do a manuscript of about 300 pages, and that's about what a novel is, by the way, it's about 300 double spaced pages. Sometimes it's 400, but 300 is about a minimum. And it would have to type everything out. And usually about halfway through, I would run out of printer ink and I'd have to get more printer ink and then the color wouldn't quite match. And so after you had printed out your 300 to 400 pages, you put them in an envelope with a cover letter to a publisher. It was called an unsolicited submission. Unsolicited means they didn't ask you for it. You were just sending it over the transom. And here's the most depressing thing. You had to put a self-addressed stamped envelope so that if they didn't want your manuscript, they would send it back. So you had to pay them to reject you. That's what it came down to. So I was writing these stories and, you know, I was all of 20 years old. So as I had said, I hadn't lived that much, which is why I'm urging people to live. Um, and I was sending out these books and I was paying them to reject me and they were coming back. I must have done, I don't know, five or six full manuscripts that got rejected by publishing house after publishing house after publishing house. And then when I was about 24, I actually got a call from an editor. A call is always good. And here's the thing you can tell about rejections. If you get a form letter that just says, no, thank you, 
that's sort of like the basic. Sometimes you might get a form letter that says no thank you, but they have a note at the bottom. Like sometimes it will say, you, you know, you're a good writer, but this isn't quite for us. Send us something else. That's huge if they wrote a handwritten note on it. Then if you get a phone call, that means they actually want to talk to you. So I got a phone call from an editor at a house called Avon, which is a paperback house. And she said to me, you know, I read your latest book. It's not at all what we're looking for. And I'm thinking, great, thanks for calling to tell me that. But she says, you know, we usually publish new authors in a genre called Regency romance. So I would love it if you could send me a proposal. And a proposal usually means three chapters and a detail outline chapter by chapter afterwards. That's your standard proposal. It usually ends up being about the first 75 to 100 pages, depending on how long your chapters are, and then a very detailed outline of the rest. So she says, would you like to send me a Regency romance? And I said, yes. And then I hung up the phone and I said, what's a Regency romance? So this is actually something that um, I also urge people. If someone says, can you do this? Say yes. You'll figure out later what it is, but yes, just go with yes. Shonda Rhimes wrote a, wrote a book called The Year of Yes. Say yes to everything. So I hung up the phone and I wondered what a Regency romance was. So I went to the library. Librarians are our friends. And I checked out eight, remember the maximum you can do. I checked out eight Regency romances, which turns out to be romance novels that are set during the Regency England period, which is a very brief period. But think of, uh, think of Jane Austen, Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice. Those are usually Regencies. So I read them all in like three or four days, all eight of the books. They weren't that long. And I wrote in a week, I knocked out three chapters and a synopsis and I sent them to her and I said, okay, well, that's that. Um, because usually back then it used to take up to six months to get an editor to give you an answer because they had so much to read. So many people were sending in unsolicited material that you could wait six months to, to, to you could wait six months to pay them to reject you. So, but she called me a week later and she said, I love it. Can you have the rest of the manuscript on my desk by next week? And I said, it's not polished yet because that sounded better than it's not written yet. So I wrote it. I took another three weeks and I just knocked it out in this fever, literally writing eight hours a day like it was a full time job. I was lucky at this time. I was still living at home as I said, so I wasn't paying rent. I was just working a little bit part-time in a doctor's office. Um, and I wrote the rest of the time and I sent it to her and they bought it. And the funny part was the editor said she was the junior editor. Junior editors have to read all the stuff that comes in. They call it the slush pile. And she said to me, it was the first book that she'd ever pulled out of the slush pile that she took to her senior editors that they agreed to buy. So it was a big deal for her. It was a big deal for me. Um, and that was the first book that I published. Now, here's the thing about writing books. Unless you're Stephen King, unless you're J.K. Rowling, unless you're one of the huge, huge names that, you know, when you walk into a bookstore, you see right there, you don't make enough money to live on for a book. So I sold the book and then I went to work. And how did I get my first television job? There was a cable channel called E! Entertainment, and they had just launched a show about soap operas. And I had been watching soap operas pretty much nonstop from the time I was 10 years old, because remember how I told you I learned English from watching soap operas? Soap operas are great for learning English because something happens, and then people talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. So you learn all the words because they keep having the same conversation over and over again. So I've been watching soap since I was 10 and I watched this show and I wrote a letter to the executive producer of the show, which I got off the credits. You know, I just read at the end, it said executive produced by, and then I looked, and again, this is before the internet where I actually had to look up their address by calling a telephone directory and everything else. And I wrote them a letter and I said, I think your show is good, but here's what it's missing. It's missing me. And here's what I could bring to your show. And I explained, I could do this and I could do this and I can do this and I can do that. And they called me, phone calls are good. This is all before email. And they called me and they asked me to come down 
I was living in San Francisco. The show was filmed in Los Angeles. So I flew down and I interviewed with them and they hired me for a week just to test me out. And they ended up hiring me and I came in as an associate producer, but by the time the show was over a year later, I was the writer on that show. So here's the other thing. Be bold, put yourself out there. And this is not me, an extremely outgoing person telling you, and you might feel I, I can't put myself out there. I don't know how to do that. I'm, I'm an introvert or I'm shy or I'm not comfortable. Um, here's the thing, put yourself out there even if you don't feel comfortable because I am not comfortable. I am to this day, if I have to call cold call someone, which is when you call someone and they're not expecting a call, I get nervous. I sometimes even script out what I'm going to say. So I am not an extrovert. I'm an introvert, I'm extremely shy, but when I want something, I push for it and that's really the only way to do it. As I said, I kept sending in books one after the other, even though I kept getting rejected. I wrote a letter to them telling them why they needed me, even though they hadn't asked. To, for me. So that's my other piece of advice. If you want to do anything, this doesn't just have to be writing. It doesn't just have to be TV. You have to understand. You have to be bold. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the publishing business. So after I sold my first book, it was a Regency romance. It was called The Fictitious Marquis. Then I sold a second book, also a Regency romance, called Thieves at Heart, at which point they closed that line. I have killed a lot of genres and they closed the line for Regency romances. So I had to start all over again. Literally, I thought when I sold my first book, I thought that's it. From now on, I'm going to be able to sell every book I write because now I'm an established writer. Doesn't work that way. So after the Regency line was closed, I had to start all over again. They wanted to write a contemporary romance. So I must have done five or six proposals before they finally bought one. That one was called Annie's Wild Ride. And my contract was a two book deal, which means after they bought Annie's Wild Ride, they would buy my second book. But guess what? The editor who bought Annie's Wild Ride quit. So they bought a new editor who didn't like my work at all. So they didn't want my second book. So the second book had to go to a new house where an editor bought it and then quit. So the editor who bought it didn't finish editing it which means it was given to a new editor who wasn't particularly interested in it. And after that, I didn't sell another book for about five years. And what simply happened was that um, there was a figure skater named Sarah Hughes. And I had also, when I was working in TV, I had also moved over. I was working for ABC Sports. I was covering their figure skating. I went to the 1998 Olympics in Nagano for Turner. So I was working for TV at the same time as I was doing this. And an editor who was looking for someone to write a book on Sarah Hughes, who was a figure skater, was speaking to another editor. Actually, it was the editor who had first bought my book almost 10 years earlier. And she remembered that I had something to do with skating. So I wrote this book on Sarah Hughes and Sarah Hughes, very kindly for me, won the 2002 Olympics. So that was great. And then the editor said, let's do a series of figure skating murder mysteries. And I said, okay. And I sent her a proposal and she said, no, that's not it. And then I sent her another proposal and I said, no, that's not it. And then they had, most of you don't remember, because this was in 2002, it was 18 years ago, they had a judging scandal where they thought a judge had been bribed to have one couple win versus another. And I wrote her one line. So this was after I had sent her 300 page proposals and she said, no, that's not it. I sent her one line. I had email by then because we've moved forward in time. And I said one line, I said, someone kills the judge who gave, gave the Russian the win over the American. And she said, yes. And so after writing all of those proposals, I ended up selling a book on just one line because it was the right place at the right time. I sent it to her Sunday night, right after the uh, pairs final, and that's what sold it. So I did five figure skating mystery novels, and then they ended that series, and I had to start all over again. Um, I had moved on at that point to working for two soap operas, As the World Turns and Guiding Light, and I wrote tie-in books which means I took the characters that were on the show and I wrote books about those characters. And then the shows were canceled. 
and I had to start all over again. I hope you're really getting the message here is the issue with writing is again, unless you're JK Rowling and you've written the first book in a series that was a massive success and they want you to keep writing them. If you're Stephen King who has been selling books forever, you're constantly having to reinvent yourself. At this point, I'd re written Regency romances and contemporary romances and nonfiction and five figure skating mysteries and three soap opera tie-in books. And again, I was starting all over again. And then there were multiple years where I couldn't sell anything. Now, I don't know those of you who have taken writing classes, if you've heard your teachers or whoever was doing it tell you to write what you know, there's some good advice there and there's some bad advice. The good advice is, as I said before, it's very difficult to write about feelings you haven't felt. It's very difficult to write about experiences you haven't had. On the other hand, I'm not suggesting those of you who want to write horror or science fiction that you need to go to the moon or that you need to meet a zombie or if you want to write fantasy that you have to be a fire breathing dragon. Because at the core of all those things, it's still real emotion. When you watch The Walking Dead, yes, it's gory and disgusting, but you're really watching it for the people. The Star Wars trilogy, which has been going on since the 70s, yes, the effects are amazing and it's a long time ago and far, far away, in a galaxy far, far away, but it's the characters that people remember. So it's perfectly possible to write what you know as long as that's the core and that's the emotion at the center of it and then have it be set in the future or the past or in another country or anything else. But we're also at a moment in publishing which is very interesting. Publishing has for a very long time been very white, very wealthy, at best middle class. And publishers are waking up slowly but surely to the fact that there's more people in America, there's more people in the world than just F. Scott Fitzgerald who writes about East Hampton or, um, or even a wizarding boarding school, which is still kind of an elite environment. So one of the things I want to talk about, and this is extremely important, I think, especially for all of you, is that publishers are looking for authentic voices. They're really looking to hear about your experience, whether you're an immigrant, whether you're a person of color, whether you're a person who identifies as LGBTQ, just something that takes you out of the mainstream that might remind people that there's a much broader world out there. So when people come to me now and they talk about what to write about, I say, let it come from you because it might be the same old story. Let's be honest. I think somebody said there's only seven basic plots. Some other people have stretched it to 12, but I'm sure those 12 are more just variations on the seven basic plots. We've all heard the man versus man, man versus nature, man versus himself, man versus the supernatural. The plot is not what's important. It's the people who are in it. It's how the plot unfolds. It's what you can say. And in fact, as I'm here, I'm talking about a book that just came out on July 14th. It's called The Nesting Dolls, and it takes place in the Soviet Union. It takes place in the Soviet Union during the 1930s, which is when they had what was called the Great Terror. At the time, Stalin was president of the Communist Party, and people were disappearing off the streets. If somebody made a joke that somebody was offended by, they could be arrested, they could be sent to Siberia, they could be executed. It was all about making sure that you said the right thing and that nobody said, oh, I heard him say something the other day against the government. It, people were that terrified. It was the great terror because people were living in terror. It takes place during the 1970s in the Soviet Union, and that was called the Great Stagnation. That was during the time, I don't know, those of you may have studied the Cold War. It was at the time when basically the Soviet Union, people weren't starving. We're not talking like the Cultural Revolution in China. That was closer to what was happening in the 30s. But people were basically, there was nothing. People stood in line for hours or hours to get food. There was no clothing. There was no furniture. You had to know someone to get anything. People were living five, six families to an apartment where everybody had a corner to themselves in a room. And you also had movements coming up. You had the uh, Free Soviet Jewry movement, which was to get the Jews to leave the Soviet Union. You had various ethnic groups, Armenians, Azerbaijanis, Georgians, Kazakhs, Uzbeks, um, people trying to break away 
from the prison that was the Soviet Union. And then the third section takes place in present day Brighton Beach, Brooklyn, which many of you may know has the large Russian speaking community and what it's like to be an immigrant child or to be the child of immigrants where your parents and your grandparents have lived through these things that you can't even possibly imagine, but you have to sort of process them and the guilt that comes with it and the responsibility that comes with it and the attempt to want to be part of the larger group, but still keeping what's unique about you, all of these issues that are both universal and very specific. And the reason that I'm telling you this story is write what you know. I had been trying to sell a story that was set in the Soviet Union since the very first day. Remember those books I said I sent and got, got rejected constantly before the Regency romances? One of them was set in the USSR and the feedback I got from all editors was, Nobody's interested in the USSR. Nobody's interested in historical. Nobody's interested in contemporary. Nobody's buying those books. Maybe if you wrote something about Imperial Russia, you know, the Tsars, Anna Karenina, people writing in Troikas, people wearing fur muffs, maybe. But I wasn't interested in that because that really wasn't the world that I knew. So I didn't pitch it. Until about three years ago, I was speaking with my agent and she said to me, you know, Russia's really hot right now. And I said, wow, that's a surprise. I'm sure we can all guess why Russia's really hot right now. But the point is, what I had to say now was suddenly valuable, whereas 30 years ago, nobody wanted to hear it. And the reason I'm saying it now is because publishing is really looking for young voices. As I said, they're really looking for young voices from people of color. They're really using, looking for immigrant narratives, LGBTQ, anything that may, takes you outside of the mainstream. So for, for kids or anyone really, but especially young people who are asking me, what should I write about? I said, write about not yourself. Because that's self-indulgent. If you just end up writing about yourself, it's interesting only to you. But write about some of the issues that are important to you, and that might be universal. So the question then becomes, well, okay, you're telling me to write. How? Who? When? To where? I don't know what to do. There are a couple of different paths that you can take to publication. The first is the basic traditional path. It's the one that I did when I said that I sent things to traditional publishing house. Simon and Schuster, Harper Collins, Random, it used to be Random House and then they um, merged with Penguin Putnam. We were all really hoping they called themselves Random Penguin, but they didn't. I, I believe it's um, Putnam, I don't know, I'm sure, I don't even remember what it is now, but it's not Random Penguin, which is actually very sad. Um, so that's the traditional way. Back when I did it, in the early 90s, you could still send a manuscript straight to the publishing house. And as I said, if you got lucky, maybe an editorial assistant would pull it out of the slush pile, read it and say, hey, this isn't terrible. I can take this to my bosses. Since then, publishing's doors have gotten a little tighter. They've closed more. You really, if you want to talk to one of the major publishers, then you need an agent. And the way that you get an agent is you send out what's called a query. It's actually what you needed to do for publishing houses, but now you need to do it to more of a gatekeeper. Agents are people who have relationships with publishing houses. So if they say to an editor, hey, I know you're looking for the next The Hate You Give, for instance, I've got a manuscript here from a kid who's got a really fresh voice and it sounds a lot like the hate you give, but it's different. And the editor has enough of a relationship and trust with the agent to say, yeah, go ahead, send it over. I'll read it because I trust your judgment. You're the gatekeeper. So what you would need to do with an agent is you need to write them a query letter. You write a letter outlining your book, no more than a page. I'd say basically two paragraphs maybe saying about your book and one paragraph about yourself. You know, I'm an 18 year old high school student in New York City. Um, I live in this community and this is an issue that I see, if it's relevant to the story. So you could go the traditional route, which is you query agents. Usually if an agent likes your query, they will ask for a proposal which is three chapters and an outline. Every once in a very rare while, you can sell a book on just a proposal and an outline, but usually if you're a first time author, they would wanna see the whole manuscript because they wanna know that you can actually deliver, you can finish. I mean, I wasn't a first time author. The Nesting Dolls is actually my 20th book, 
but because I hadn't written in this genre before, which is historical fiction, they had me write the whole book before they made an offer on it. So even though it was my 20th book, they still wouldn't buy it on a partial. So it's unlikely that they would buy a new author on a partial. You write the whole book, the agent then sends it to the publishing house. If the publishing house agrees to accept it, they publish the book, they edit it. Remember what I said about copy editing? They design the cover, they print it, they ship it to bookstores, they do all of that. That's traditional. This day and age, you also have an option that I didn't have when I was starting out, which is you can self-publish. Self-publish means you write the book yourself, you format it, which you can pretty much do with a lot of just word processing pro, um, programs. You can put it out as an ebook, which means it doesn't cost you anything except just the formatting, but you design the cover, you do the copy editing, you can upload it to Amazon and Barnes and Noble and a lot of other um, sites that can do that sort of thing. You can also do a print on demand, which means you format it and if somebody orders it, it gets printed at Amazon or at a particular site and gets sent to them. You can also print a bunch of copies. You can print 400 copies and then sell them yourself, but that means putting money up front. I tend to not recommend that because that's an investment of both time and money, whereas an ebook is just something that as long as you format it, it doesn't cost you extra money to print it. You might pay someone to design the cover, that's up to you, but that's self-publishing. And there are some people who do really well at it. There, some, there was a teenager, I think about 10, 15 years ago, I think it was Amanda Hawking, where she was writing a series of vampire romances and publishing them herself electronically. And she was selling more copies that when she actually did finally get a publishing contract from a traditional house, she actually made less money from it than she did when she was selling them herself. So that's, that's always an option. There is also, you can just write things and print them and put them up online. There's Wattpad, there's all sorts of sites where you get readers. And here's the thing, it really depends on what your objective is. If you want to make money, the most money you'll make will likely be in traditional publishing, but it'll take a while. It could take years. Self-publishing is quicker. You can put the books up yourself, but you'll probably make less money. If you're just looking for readers, there are a lot of sites where you can put up content for free and get feedback. And sometimes that's more valuable because maybe before you send a manuscript to an agent, before you put up a manuscript for sale, even yourself through self-publishing, you want to see if people like what you write. Some people do fan fiction. They'll write in the Harry Potter world or they'll write in the Star Wars world or they'll write in the Vampire Diaries world or anything else just to see if people like their stories and how they handle their characters. Some people do original works, but again, it really depends on what your objective is. So there is a business side to this and there is a personal fulfillment side for this. If you just want to get people's feedback and some of it will be negative. I'm not sure I'm not telling, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know when I say there's some mean people on the internet and some people just like to troll and that's unfortunate. But the fact of the matter is if you just want people to read your writing, there are all sorts of options there. And if you want to write professionally, you can start by putting your work online and seeing what kind of feedback you get. You can put your work online, self-publish, and see if people will pay for your work. And at the same time, you can be working on another manuscript that you could also be shopping for, to a, um, an agent for traditional representation. You don't have to pick just one. This isn't like all of us by this Friday have to decide remote learning or hybrid learning and you have to commit to just one. You can do hybrid publishing. You can self-publish for free. You can self-publish for cost and keep working on other material at the same time. So this has been a little bit of my background, how I came to write The Nesting Dolls, which is available right now at your favorite bookstore or online if you don't want to go out and touch anything. Um, otherwise, I'm open for any questions about either how to write, writing style, publishing, and anything. Um, also, I know a lot of you probably are at this point are working on personal essays for college or even for high school, if, if we ever find out what screened high school admissions will be this year. So 
the main thing I can say about that is once again, it's unlikely you will write something original. So what you want to do is you want to have a voice. You want to have a voice that sounds fresh. And here's the problem. I went to high school too, and I went to college and people who teach writing tend to push everyone towards sounding sort of the same. And it's very nerve wracking because you don't want to really sort of take a chance and sound different and sound goofy. But if you want to stand out, whether it's for publication or whether it's a, whether it's a um, essay for college admissions or for high school admissions, you want them to see you. And the way that they see you is by hearing you. I, I always tell people to draw a picture of themselves. You, but I don't mean physically. I mean draw a picture of yourself in the mind of the reader. If you just say, I'm a hard worker, those are words. They don't tell you anything. But if you say, since I was eight years old, ever since I came home from school, the first thing I did was change my clothes, have a snack, drink a glass of milk, and then I sat down at the piano, and for an hour and a half, I would work on one particular piece. And I spent a year working on the Rachmaninoff, and I had problems with this and this until I was finally able to play it. That draws a picture in your head. If you say, I love math, that's nice. But maybe you can tell us about how you first fell in love with math or what is it about math that speaks to you. If you can invoke an emotion, the main thing that I stress is paint a picture. I want to be able to see you in my mind's eye because when I'm reading 100 essays, 200 essays, 300 essays, all from kids who tell me they're hard workers and they like math, nothing's going to stick in my head. The only thing that's going to stick in my head is if you've painted a picture that doesn't look like anybody else. And your picture shouldn't look like anyone else because you are you. And the reason you like math could be completely different from the reason why somebody else like math. So let me see you. Does anyone have any questions, anything about writing, anything about publishing, anything about, I don't know why there's red walls behind me? Um, any, uh, guys, if you have any questions, type it into the chat box right now, okay? Please use this opportunity. Um, and I don't want to minimize the reality that it's really hard to get published the way that Alina's getting published. It's a really big deal. I mean, I think I'm pretty cool, but we self-publish. So <laughs> I'm just well, letting you guys we, know. So here we have a question from Fatima. What do you do when you get writer's block? That's a really great question. And usually if I'm speaking to adults, I kind of get pithy and I say, I just look at my bank account and I see how much money I need to make. So I sit down and do it. But the real answer is this, and I, and I will answer you honestly. I tell myself, you don't have to write more than one sentence. I make myself sit down. It's good to have a schedule. And I tend to have a schedule. Now it's all crazy because I have three kids and they're all at home. And as you can imagine, it's not as easy to keep a schedule as it is on a business day. But I tell myself, just write one sentence. And the sentence doesn't have to be good. And the sentence can just be declaratory. Like literally, it can be my character. Let's say her name is Molly. Molly woke up. I tell myself, just write that one sentence. Molly woke up. And then I sit there and I look at it for a while, I go, and then what happened next? Molly woke up and stretched. Okay. Molly woke up and stretched and looked out the window. Well, now I want to know what she sees out the window. So Molly woke up, stretched, and looked out the window. She saw that the tree house she had built was falling down. Well, why is it falling down? What does she do about it? I literally tell myself I'm going to do right one line at a time. I don't put any more pressure on myself than that. And then what usually happens is I find the scene. I may have written three paragraphs by the time I found out, ah, the scene is about the fact that someone has come in the middle of the night and stolen something out of her treehouse. So now I can get rid of the paragraph about Molly waking up. I can get rid of all that. I can just start from there. A lot of stuff that what you write, you're just, you're looking. It's like Michelangelo once said that he didn't sculpt. The sculpture was in the marble. He just had to find it. He just had to keep getting rid of things until he had to find it. And that's sort of what writing is. You have to find out what you're trying to say. Also, sometimes it's good to just start with a declarative statement. This is the scene where Molly discovers that someone stole her treehouse. 
and then go from there. If you make a statement of what's going to be, there's a, a writer, Janet Daly. She publishes, I believe, about 40 books a year. She is very, very prolific. And she once said, it's easier to rewrite a bad page than a blank page. Because the fact of the matter is, if you wrote crap, and I write crap, in fact, I am not thrilled with what I wrote today. I'm hoping maybe out of the 10 pages I wrote today, there's a paragraph or two that's decent. But it's easier to rewrite bad than if I'm just staring at a blank page. So short answer to writer's block, write just one sentence and then write what happened after that and then write what happened after that and then write what happened after that and maybe then you'll figure out what it is that you want to write about um can you elaborate on high on hybrid publishing well here's the thing some people some people as i said they self-publish by both um putting their book up electronically making it available making it available as print on demand which means you don't pay money up front, but you have to format it. Um, or, and, and or, imagine the slash in the end, or, or printing the books out themselves and selling it themselves. Like sometimes if people have a particular theme, like actually this is a perfect example, Queller Prep. They have books for test prep that they don't need to sell necessarily through Barnes and Noble or through Shakespeare and Co or a bookstore. They can sell them online on Amazon themselves. Amazon takes self-published books, which is actually great. So does actually barnesandnoble.com. Not the physical stores, but barnesandnoble.com. They can sell them directly to customers who come for prep. They can sell them if they go to education fairs. So some people, like some people who write in a very particular niche, like there's some people who maybe write about flower arranging. And it's the kind of book that a major publisher wouldn't buy because there aren't enough people who are into flower arranging. But if they go to flower arranging shows, they could sell their book there. In fact, two of the books that I've written, one is called Getting Into NYC Kindergarten, and another one is called Getting Into NYC High School. I don't know if any of you have heard me speak about Getting Into NYC High School. I self-published those books because to a big publisher, they won't sell enough. Publishers need to sell internationally. Very few people in Kathmandu want to buy a book about getting into New York City kindergarten. In fact, people in New Jersey don't want to buy a book on getting into New York City kindergarten unless they're moving. But I know my audience. My audience here in New York, I speak at Queller Prep. I speak at um, private meetings. I have a website. So that is exactly the kind of niche publishing that you can do if you're writing about a topic where you know where the audience is better than a major New York, New York City or any other publisher would. So that actually is an example of hybrid is that you could do some things electronically, you could do some things in print, you can make partnerships, for instance, with my figure skating mysteries after they were published traditionally. They were published by Berkeley Prime Crime, um, which is an imprint of Berkeley Books. Um, after they were no longer being published, I got the rights back and I self-published them myself, but I made partnerships with like, there's a company called the Ice Theater of New York. They're in Chelsea Piers. They sell them to their folks and they get a cut. There are online skate shops that sell equipment. They sell them. So you can make partnerships. And that's what I meant by hybrid. Um, which types of essays do students write in high school? I I'm not sure if I understand the question. Do you mean the kind that you write for getting into high school? Or do you mean the kind of things that you would just need to write in an English class in high school? Because those are two different things. All right, I'm moving on. I have a real life story. It is very interesting and complicated. I don't know where to start. Would like to have a guest writer. Where to find a great one? Well, are you when you say guest writer, are you talking about a ghost writer, someone who would write the story for you, or are you talking about someone that you could collaborate with? Because a, co a ghost writer is a person you hire and you pay money to, and they write the story. But what you could do is you could join their very often writing groups. All people who are interested in becoming writers, they get together. I mean, these days they probably do it on Zoom. They read their work. They critique each other. It's not a class in the sense that there's not a teacher sitting at the front and telling you how to do it. It's usually, I wouldn't go more than five, six, or seven people who are all aspiring writers. They read their work. They offer each other feedback. I have a lot of friends who actually workshopped 
their novels by doing this week after week, you know, reading a chapter and having people say, well, that part wasn't clear, or I think that part dragged, or I think that part wasn't an, as interesting. So there are lots of opportunities to find writing groups. And that way, even though the people aren't writing it with you, you are writing your own story. They can give you feedback as you go along. So. Also, do you usually need more than one editor for things such as copywriting, proofwriting, and developmental editing? That depends. If you're doing it traditionally, that's all done in-house. You will have a developmental editor who will give you notes like, you know, I think you should make this character a little clearer, or I think a scene here would help us explain, or basically, for instance, my book, the one that's out now, The Nesting Dolls, when I originally wrote it, it had chapters where um, every chapter was a new time period. And the editor said to me, no, make it chronological, make it so the whole 1930s story happens, then the 1970s stories happens, then the current story. That's a developmental editor. Then once we had agreed on all the content, it went to a copy editor who found all sorts of grammar mistakes or inconsistencies. Like she said, here, you said he has green eyes and here you say he has brown eyes. So I said, let's compromise and say he has hazel eyes, but that kind of thing. Someone who reads it very, very closely. If you are doing it yourself and you are hiring people to do it, and I don't advocate hiring people because I don't advocate spending your own money. It's just, it's one thing if you can do it yourself for no money and then put it up and try to sell. I don't recommend spending hundreds of dollars, which is what a lot of developmental editors and copy editors will charge. I think you can get almost the same thing as I mentioned a writing group and then you can also even trade like for instance sometimes people say I'll copy edit your book you copy edit my book I think there's ways to do this without spending money I am not a fan of spending money in advance and I'm especially not a fan of publishers who ask you to pay in advance there are some people out there who are basically scammers and they're preying on people who very desperately want to get their books published. And they say, well, give us $500 and we will edit your book and we will do a cover for your book and we will market your book. That's very, very, very rarely worth it. Most of the time you could get more for less if you do it piecemeal. So that's my thing. If a publisher asks you for money, they're not legit. You can do anything you want. I'm not stopping you, but that's my particular advice. So, Let's see. What types of writing do you have to write in high school? Well, in high school, you can do, um, there's all sorts of things. You might be writing critical essays. Usually there's a lot of critical reading, you know, compare this book to that book, explain the emotions of a character. Sometimes you might want, they might ask for your particular emotions in a story. Like how did this story make you feel? Why do you think this character is A, B, or C? And then of course, there's some high schools that offer creative writing courses where you can write science fiction or fantasy or anything that you want but most writing in high school is of the read this book and tell me how this character tell me how Holden Caulfield in Catcher in the Rye is like um, Harry Potter I, I doubt you would write that um, but it's a lot of it's it's analytical writing and it's the kind of writing that I was actually talking before where writing teachers kind of want everybody to sound the same so um, I'm not a huge fan of writing programs in general. It's one thing to learn grammar rules. It's one thing to learn structure. But I think the only thing you learn for creative writing, writing for a teacher, is you learn how to please that teacher, which is actually extremely important because at some point in your career, you're going to have to write to please an editor. But it's not the where all end all because one teacher may like one type of voice and one teacher may like another type of voice. So listen to them about grammar, listen to them about structure, certainly listen to them about spelling, but don't listen to them about voice. Do your own voice, write, write what you would want to read. That's usually the best advice that I could give. Let's see, do we have any other questions? I know we're almost out of time. This was an hour, it was gonna end at eight. So we have a few more minutes. Does anybody have any other last minute questions either about writing, about publishing, about submitting? I, I have a lot to say, as you can tell, I like to talk. So I'm looking in the box. I don't think we have any more questions. 
at this point, um, Francis, if you're still there, I don't know if you want to sort of sum up, if you want to say anything, or whether we'll just say good night and thank you everyone for coming. And if you're interested in my book, my website is alinaadams.com. You can see I have all my books up there, starting from the very first ones. If you actually want to see what a first book looks like someone, I think I was 23 at the time, that's The Fictitious Marquis. It's the very first one to the nesting dolls, which is out right now. I, I definitely think there's a difference. I think my early books are much, much younger, even though they take place in the, uh, in the, was it the 18th century? I still think they sound kind of like a kid writing in the 1990s. It's, uh, for a long time in my career, I was writing about people older than me. Basically, when I wrote both Annie's Wild Ride, which I wrote in 98, and a book called When a Man Loves a Woman in the year 2000. In the year 2000, I was, how old was I in the year 2000? I was not even 30, and I was writing about characters in their early 40s. And the same thing. And I read them now, actually, when I re-released them as electronic books, I reread them and I thought, wow, I thought I knew what older people sounded like, but I didn't. Uh, did I build my own website? Okay, here's where I confess. I have a husband. He's very good at tech. He built it. So uh, most people build their own. It's actually not that hard. You can use WordPress and you can use other things. But I cheated. I married someone who knew how to do it. Anything else? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. As I said, you can go to alinaadams.com. You have all my books there. You can see how they go. And uh, have a great evening. And good luck, Francis. Oh, thank you so much. I'm for here. I'm here. Everyone, let's type thank you into the chat. Hold on. I'm going to go off here. Everyone, <laughs> let's type box. I'm really glad we got to listen. And um, behind the scenes, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm honored. We had a nice peek and information. And Goldie's going to say goodbye. Let's go do a cameo <laughs> with the doggie. She always gets a cameo in the videos. Goldie. Yay, Goldie. And this is actually one of our school teachers. We are starting our homeschool program, which uh, I, I assume Alina's heard about already. Okay, so that's it. Come, Goldie. Let's say bye to everyone, Goldie. All okay? right. Bye-bye, everyone. Good Thank night. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Alina. This was so great. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. I'm going to end the recording, okay? Bye. All right, everyone. Say thank you, guys. Say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.